On the 11th of October 2000, the body of Reggie Cray made the long journey through the East End of London to its final resting place. Thousands of mourners lined the streets to pay their respects to a man whose reign of terror, alongside twin brother Ronnie, ended some 30 years earlier when they were in prison for murder. But why were two convicted killers so revered by the British public? Who were the real Crays? This film offers unprecedented access to their trusted friends, loyal confidants, and most bitter enemies. Silences will be broken. Dark brooding looks and violent temperaments, twins Ronald and Reginald Cray became notorious early in life. Alongside older brother Charlie, the boy's upbringing was typical of working class London. But this was no ordinary family. These boys were destined to stand out. Maureen Flanagan, former actress and one of Britain's first page three girls, first met the Cray family when she was just 17. 1961. Well, London was buzzing. Swing in 60s was just beginning. Everything was changing. Fashion, politics. We had the pill. Some women were going out to work, like me. And um, it was a very busy area, most respectful. Uh, and that's when I met the notorious Cray family. When I was about 19, come out of prison, I was young then, I knew their father, and sometimes I'd go home with the Crays, their father, rather than them, and they were back from evacuation, Reggie and Ronnie. They was only about nine years of age and they used to call me Uncle Frank. I met Charlie, the elder brother. He was uh, the elder by seven years from the twins. I met him first, found him most handsome and charming. Then he introduced me to his mother at their house in Valence Road. He said she wanted someone to come home and do her hair every week, rather than sit in a salon and be unindated with the requests, which she always was. So along I went, I met this charming, lovely, kind, typical East End mother who just happened to be the mother of the most notorious men in London. I saw this woman in Bethnal Green Road <coughs> in shopping bags, and I said, old lady, can I give you a hand? She said, oh, would you, son? So anyway, she lived in Valence Road. I didn't know who she was. When I got to the doorstep, I went to give her the bag, she said, come and have a cup of tea. I couldn't believe it. Two geezers in there, you couldn't tell them apart. That was Ronnie and Reggie. I found Mrs. Cray, Violet, a wonderful child. I had an affinity with her the minute I met her. I knew I'd have a friend for life. Typical mother who loved and adored the sons. Mr. Cray, who I always called Mr. Cray, and never called Charles the whole years I met him, I found him quite a withdrawn, miserable man, but then he wasn't there very often. Hence, no authority, no fatherly authority in the house. Was there much between Ronnie or Reggie? No, no, they were about the same as most brothers, you know, they'd have their arguments and one thing, thing now and again. But otherwise, they were OK, yeah. OK is not how the other children of Bethnal Green remember the terrible twins. Those that somehow offended Ronnie and Reggie were beaten mercilessly. The twins' grandfather recognised their lust for violence and urged them to channel their vicious energy into the noble art of boxing. As former friend and true crime author, Bernard O'Mahony explains. This is the famous Repton Boxing Club, where all three Cray brothers came to learn their trade. They were influenced by their grandfather, Cannonball Lee, himself a proficient boxer. Well, Reggie, I thought Reggie was a, ra a really good fighter. I think he could have been a champion. What, what used to happen was, started in the school playground, having little scraps, chinning people, and then after that, in the street, chinning people. I think they were destined, from little boys, to be leaders. She spoiled them terribly. What they wanted, they had. And then they grew up and they thought what they saw, what they wanted, they took. Demanding, devious and dangerous, 
The twins did indeed commandeer whatever they wanted, whether it was money, material items, or manpower. Eddie Richardson and Frank Fraser of the rival gang the Richardsons knew the twins and their firm all too well. It was a mixture of fear and respect. Respect because women and children, untouchable. Ordinary guys who went to work and they're untouchable. Any rows we had, was only amongst ourselves. And if we hurt or killed one another, so what? That was violent, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, in their, in their own little way, I suppose, that was violent, yeah. So it was we, wasn't we? So, uh, you know. But that didn't worry you and your brother, no? Never, never. I tell you that if they put me and my brother in a cell with them two, there's only two people coming out, and that's me and my brother. They wanted to be gangsters. They set out to be gangsters. I was invited to go around the house one day, and I went down there, and they're all sitting, the, the twins and Charlie sitting there. And then Charlie stood up and he said, welcome to the firm, like some fucking board meeting. And he said, we want you on our firm to earn money with us. I was with them on and off for about 20 odd years. What sort of work did you do for them? I said, mainly drive them about and be with them in general, you know. I used to live with Reggie and Ronnie. All of us, three of us used to live there, four of us used to live there first. In 1956, Ronnie Cray had begun to display the early signs of a man suffering from mental illness. He shot a man for little or no reason and severely beat another for which he was sentenced to three years imprisonment. On Christmas Day, 1957, Ronnie's beloved Aunt Rose died and he suffered a complete breakdown. He was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and returned to Long Grove Asylum near Epsom, a secure mental facility. Reggie saw this as an ideal opportunity to free his identical twin. What decided me to to, to, to get wrong away from Long Road, that day in Epson, was some of the stories you told me about the place. One day, he was sitting there, eating an apple, and this nutter come along and smacked him in the eye, as he would tell you, just because he was eating an apple, because his place was full of nutters. Against all odds, Reggie did indeed manage to free his brother. In the meantime, a long-term associate of the firm named Freddie Foreman had been given a place to live by the twins. He had inadvertently become indebted to them, something he would later come to regret. And I stayed in Ronnie Cray's flat when he'd, he'd escaped from uh, um, uh, Epson, the mental place, oh, right, yeah, yeah. and he was holed up in his flat, and uh, that, they gave me his flat to, to live in. And I, I got my wife and kids over there, they went to school over there, and uh, that's how I come to live in the East End and got to know the Cray family very well. I, I never trusted Reggie. Uh, I thought he sat on the fence and he would go whatever way suited him. Whereas Ronnie was more, if you give his word, he would stick to his word. No, he was the nuttiest one of the two. He was a very, very scary man. Believe me, I had met a lot of scary people. But Ronnie Cray was a very, very sick, psychopathical, schizophrenia and manic depressive all rolled in one in one word of his mouth he meant everything he said he wasn't right in the head it definitely wasn't right in the head after ronnie had been returned to custody a notorious landlord named peter rackman was approached by reggie cray who demanded protection money rackman was notorious for bullying and exploiting his tenants but he was no match for reggie in an effort to pacify Cray, he offered to sell him a West End nightclub for a nominal fee. Things went well initially, but then Ronnie was released. I was there on the meeting when they took it over, uh, but they took the East End to, to Knightsbridge. It, you know, all them ugly looking bastards with their cuts down their faces and all that, and, and uh, flat noses, and they should have left the club as it was and run it as, and without it, and just sat back and, and got the, collected the debts that was owed. And that's all they needed to do. But of course they burned the place, like they burned every fucking thing, you know. Anyway, every club they had, the business they had, they, they burned it with the clientele they used to uh, take down there. 
I'd see people laughing and having a good time five minutes before he walked through the door. The minute he walked through the door, that laughter stopped. The conversation dimmed. People were terrified that he would say, are you laughing at me? And then he had that paranoid feeling that they were laughing at him, and then there'd be a bloodbath. Random acts of violence were part and parcel of Ronnie Cray's disturbing world. Lenny Hamilton, jewel thief and longtime friend of the family, suffered a terrible ordeal after a dispute with a man whose father knew the craze. Andy came home uh, 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 and he said, Len, Ronnie wants to see you up the club. I thought, well, well I ain't done nothing to him, like, you know. And I was going in and out their house and that, like, as a friend. So I go up there, get a cab, black cab, and go up there. They show me in the kitchen, and Ronnie was standing with his back to the, I don't know, but it was a gas stove. Then he told two people, two fellas, to get hold of me, and they got hold of me, like, and that's when I see the pokers on the gas. He said, now I'm gonna burn your fucking eyes out. And as he's coming towards me, someone shouted out, no, well, not that, and he just stopped. He walked, as he walked away too, he said, you can go now. In July 1964, the Sunday Mirror published a story about Ronnie being involved in a sleazy sexual relationship with a conservative politician named Lord Boothby. After the twins threatened the journalist involved and Boothby threatened to sue, the newspaper backed down. It sacked the editor, printed an apology and paid Boothby £40,000. A friend of Ronnie Cray named Toby Von Judge the son of a high court judge, knew the allegations about Cray, Boothby and young men were true. And so he confronted the peer. I said, tell me something, what sort of a, a man like you can come to somebody like Ronnie and demand your boys? He said, I beg your pardon. I said, I've asked you a straightforward question, your lordship or whatever you are. Oh, it's none of your concern. He kept on saying it was none of my concern and this really got up my nose. What are you doing with a person like Ronnie Cray? And then Ronnie butted in, he said, Toby, that's enough. He's a friend. He does me favors. That's it. No more questions. So I left it at that. He left rather quickly. Ronnie Cray and Lord Boothby were not the only ones enjoying the sexual revolution of the promiscuous swinging 60s. Freddie Foreman's brother, George, was having an affair with the wife of an East End villain named Jimmy Evans. When he learned of his wife's adultery, Evans and an associate named Tommy Ginger Marks decided to shoot George. All I knew was someone come round to me and uh, got the message that George was in hospital, in St Thomas's hospital, and someone had shot him uh, on his doorstep while he was he was having a meal with his wife and kids. Someone, Ginger, knocked at the door. He went and answered the door, and then someone stepped out of the shadows with a shotgun and, and blasted him in, 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 the, in the lower area, in the top of the caught him in the top of the leg. He was lucky in that respect, and. Uh, of course, I'll go, I'll go to the hospital and the police stay on the bed and they, they went and had a cigarette and they were over there and he just whispered Ginger Tom and that's the only name I had. Well, well the twins knew all, everyone in the East End and so when I went to see the, the twins, they told me who Ginger Tom was, you know, and so that was Tommy Marks. By then I found out through that who the other fellow was. I didn't know about the relationship he was having with this girl. I had no idea he'd been carrying on with somebody else's wife, you see. So that was something that was a shock to me. And uh, we, so uh, naturally I had to take revenge, you know. So they pulled on him one day in Cheshire Street and they ordered that Jim. They wanted Jimmy Evans. But Ginger Marks turned around thinking he'd called Gin. And they shot Ginger Marks, dragged him in the motor and whipped him off. And that was the last they saw of him. Somehow, amongst all of the bloodletting and hatred, Reggie Cray found love. Initially, his heart was stolen by a young man. 
but when he rejected his advances, he started a relationship with the man's sister, a beautiful young girl named Frances Shea. Reggie knew Frances, I think, from the age of about 14. But first of all, he knew her brother. And I think probably would have had an affair with the brother first, had it been consented, but the brother didn't want to know. And then he'd met the, the sister, who was equally beautiful, and started this love affair. At last, he'd found somebody, Reggie, that he really, really fell in love with. He was absolutely, he adored her, and Ronnie absolutely hated that. And he had no intentions, or so he thought at the time, to let this marriage go ahead. And he did everything in his power to stop this marriage. Very jealous of, of Francis, he was. But eventually, the marriage did take place. But he never liked Francis, ever, Ronnie. Eleven months after the wedding, Cray Firm member Richard Dickey Hart was shot dead at a nightclub called Mr Smith's in South London. Eddie Richardson, Mad Frankie Fraser and other members of the Cray's rival gang, the Richardsons, were said to be involved. Ronnie Cray's moment had arrived. He was going to teach the Richardson gang and everybody else that they shouldn't mess with him or his firm. I don't know, it was sort of underlying rivalry. We, we never actually clashed in any way, you know. I had six betting shops, you know, betting offices. And one of these young guys, he's only 20, Kenny Hampton, he got bashed up down in the toilets for no reason or but I kicked the shit out of him. I find out that Eddie and, and Fraser and them had done, uh, and uh, the rest of the, uh, the firm. My brother George had, a, had the Red Cell Club up at Clapham Common, and they were all down there, and George rang me, he said, well, they're all down downstairs. And, I, and so I went down there, and uh, I was very angry, and I only went with one person, Ronnie, Ronnie King, and they was all in a group, and I, and I went up, went over and I pulled them, I pulled Eddie about it, and, uh, and uh, I stuck this 38 up his nostril, you know, up his nose. Someone from up north, through, through Billy Hill actually, and uh, he got in touch with Billy and then and he, and he put us in touch to put a couple of people on the door in the club. To, you know, so that's what we was going to do. We went over there and was unaware that uh, other things had been going on. I walked up to, to Dickie, I said, what are you doing? He's gone, a luger. I said, a luger, it was a luger. He said, Jim, it's going to be war tonight. He said, I'll be. I said, Dick. I said, don't be silly. Took the gun off him. Put it in the girl's bag that I was with, right? Then, bum, 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 all, all everything else happened. Then, Dickie Hart, somehow or other, he got the gun. Anyway, they had two guns. We never had no guns. And then one of them wanted to have a fight with me. We had a fight on the, on the dance floor. I'd done him on the dance floor set a stride of him, I want to really punch his head through the fucking floorboard, to be quite honest. But I've been wanting to get shot in the back. Then there was a bit of movement from outside, and that's when Dickie Harp lost his gun. And he got one from the gun, but he didn't survive it. And all of a sudden the phone went, I went, hello, it's Ted. He went, Jim, Dickie Hart's dead, got killed. I said, oh, I'll see you in the morning. I thought, oh, God, no, that was, that was it. Eddie and uh, Fraser and and uh, and uh, and all the rest of the firm had been down there, and uh, it, it kicked off. About four people had been shot, you know. Ronnie Jeffries got shot, I got shot, Fraser got shot, Harry Rawlings got shot. And of course, that, that was like an open warfare now. It was sort of, like, that was the beginning of all the trouble. The night after Dickie Hart's murder, Ronnie Cray heard that George Cornell was drinking in the Blind Beggar pub. He summoned his friend Ian Barry, and as they entered the premises, Barry fired two shots into the ceiling. Ronnie saw Cornell at the bar, and as he approached him, Cornell said, look who's here. But Ronnie didn't answer. He pulled out a Luger and shot Cornell through the forehead. Cornell slumped forward and eventually fell to the floor, where he died moments later. 
Georgie Cornell was from East London and he'd gone over to South London to to join up with the, the Richardson firm. So they felt that he'd changed his loyalties from East to South. Ronnie Quay used to get the out with people for, for very little reason, you know. They didn't need a lot of excuses to get the out with people. And this, this, this was a, a bad, a, a bad thing about him because of his mental state. You know, he, he was, wasn't a well person. He wasn't well at all. On the 12th of December 1966, Frank Mitchell was sprung from Dartmoor Prison and brought to this flat on Barking Road. Frank Mitchell was a product of the environment. He stole a bike when he was a little kid. And his father, instead of going around to the person's house and saying, look, this, my, my son's just nicked your boy's bike, here's his bike back, he didn't do that. He took him to the police station. He got the kid uh, in juvenile court. Mitchell started off when he was a 16-year-old kid. He stole a push bike. He got nicked for that, and then he went through the, the system, Bullstool. If a screw said something to him, he chinned him, and that was it. Ronnie Craig got friendly with him in, in Wandsworth, and he looked at, he used to send visitors in, give him money in, and uh, look after him. And because he wound up in, in uh, Rampton for the criminal insane, and uh, he, he was a handful to, uh, for the prison system and uh, with uh, uh, attacking and screws and other prisoners. And uh, I know he, he stabbed Bruce Reynolds in, in uh, Worm and Scrubs in the bathhouse, which I never forgot. I remember, yeah, I remember the, the, yeah, yeah, Bruce was a good, he was a great pal of mine, Bruce. And uh, I was up, uh, when I heard about that, I, I wasn't happy about that anyway. So Ronnie, with all these connections and his, his political connections with these different people, Booth B and Co and Dryberg and all that activities that were going on, he thought he could pull a few strings. And if he got, if he got Mitchell out, he would be able to give, get him a release date. And if he handed himself in after six months and, 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 mis and behaved himself and never got in any trouble. Frankie was a very tough geezer, but he wasn't a Libby taker. He thought he could go out and, and club it out and, and uh, put himself on the firm and go and do all sorts of villainy with the twins and be their right-hand man and, you know, in his mentality. Uh, and, and, of course, he couldn't do none of those things. All he could do was ex exchange one place, one prison for another, really. Unfortunately, Mitchell, was an absolutely huge man, had a lot of demands. He wanted a woman. The craze brought him a woman. He wanted food, ridiculous amounts. They were bringing him food, alcohol. So they did everything to keep him quiet. Got him, got him an hostess to put, and some sex and things like. That. And uh, 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 tried their best to keep him sweet. And then the idea was to smuggle him out out abroad, you know, to get him to Australia or Spain or somewhere where he could live the rest of his life. And uh, I had the facilities to do that because I'd got people out of the country for previous, you know, train robbers out of the country. I managed to do that, you know. He got too much for them. I mean, uh, they couldn't handle him. They was fucking had minders around there looking after him 24 hours, seven. He's in a flat in Barking. Yeah, he? yeah. The bird was all right to start with because he's an handsome man, a good figure, and a physique. But uh, now that you realise what, what he really is like, you know. Eventually he started saying, I want to get out, I want to go and walk around the streets. And he became an absolute headache for the twins. So as the twins did, they decided any sort of headache, they were going to kill him. And so they had minders looking after him day and night and they were all terrified and shit scared of him. And um, they, wasn't, uh, they was complaining all the time. And so they got me over, asked me to come over, and I went to see Reggie and uh, Charlie, and, and they said, can you get us out of trouble here and help us? And they had rings under their eyes, and they, they threatened to go around and take their mother hostage, and they only knew what to, to blame him. If, and they would take six coppers with him, uh, if 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 uh, if it was the police turned up, he would shoot his way out. The Crays had always been keen to learn how Foreman managed to dispose of Ginger Marks's body, because back in the 1960s, the police worked largely on the assumption that if there wasn't a body, then there hadn't been a murder. 
However, Foreman refused to disclose his darkest secret, a decision which led him to be called upon to dispose of bodies on more than one occasion. So now, 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 now they're really worried now. So now they've got to get some help from somewhere and um, they come to me again. So I, I, I go over and see them and they, so I made arrangements to pick him up and take him out of the country. On the night of Christmas Eve 1966, uh, Albert Donoghue was in the flat with uh, Frank and um, some men came to the door and said, you know, we're going to take you to see the twins. The girl will have to stay here, but you come with us. So Albert walked um, out of the flat with Frank. He said goodbye to the girl and they went out through that door into the street. My job is to get Frank out of the, ha out of the flat and into the van. He's got his girlfriend, so it was easy because I could say to him, you know Ronnie won't have women around him, so we take, what we do, we take you, Frank, and then I'll bring the girl along afterwards and follow up. He's supposed to spend a fortnight down in Kent somewhere. After leaving the flat, Albert Donoghue and Frank Mitchell walked around the corner to Ladysmith Avenue. And a young copper come round the corner. <coughs> and Frank, I felt him, I felt him tense up now, he said, Turn it in, Frank. Parked on the curbside was an old comma style van. The back doors were open and inside sat Freddie Foreman and another man named Alfie Gerard. They motioned for Mitchell to get into the vehicle and he sat on the wheel casing. There was a small partition between the back of the van and the driving the cab. So I sat down and uh, then Gerard Callahan has shut the back doors and he walked around and got in the passenger seat and slammed the passenger door. Oh, I didn't know till later. When he slammed that passenger door, that was the signal that everything's all right. Uh, and that is when the guns opened up. The fella called Donoghue brought him out and uh, walked him around and put him in the back and climbed in the van with him. And he should never have climbed in the van, but he did. I had Elfie Gerard sitting next to me. And the next one was Freddie Foreman. The people in the flat heard the gunshots going off, you know, they heard the, 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 the shots going off. So it was car backfiring and all that, and the girl panicked and they panicked and everybody panicked. They was pumping shots into him and it was, uh, uh, grinding, it wasn't dead. It didn't kill him. And then Gerard said, go on Fred, give me another one, I'm empty. I was pleased to hear at least one of the guns is empty. Foreman's put his gun muzzle behind his ear and going bang. That was the final shot. But the twins wanted him out, didn't they? And they got him out. And look what they done to him. The girl was getting a bit excited. And I phoned Reggie and said, the dog, that dog won. She said, I said, the dog is dead right now. I said, the dog won. That was to tell Reggie that Mitchell was off the plot, you know. The phone call went through and he's, and Reggie Cray said the dog is, that dog, uh, Donoghue said that dog is one, you know, which was the, say that everything was okay, you know, that was the, the sort of code message. Frank Mitchell has never been seen since. Following the disappearance of Frank Mitchell, Reggie Cray's wife, Frances, was becoming less of the starry-eyed young girl she once was. She was his missus, his property. The pressure this caused led to rows between the couple which became hideously abusive. Eventually, Frances had packed her bags and returned to her parents' home. In the summer of 1967, Reggie and his wife were reunited and planning a holiday, but before that could happen, Frances was found dead in her bed. She was just 23 years old. I think the person that murdered Frances, and I'm sorry to say this, but categorizing the times that I've spent with her, and this will be a shock to everybody, but it was a no-nonsense effort because Frances got pregnant. Nobody knows that but I do. She had what they called bulimia and was a very manic depressive. She didn't like Ronnie in 
any way, shape or form. But I think maybe the mother had something to do with Francis's death. Not Reggie, he loved her too much. Ronnie tolerated her because it kept him stable. Mrs. Cray could never have treated her badly. And as for this ridiculous notion that Ronnie had anything to do with her death, I would dispute that to my dying day, because although he didn't like her, he would never have harmed her in any way because Reggie would never have forgiven him. I don't think Violet Cray liked Frances whatsoever. She was jealous of her because she was losing one of her babies. And they were going out more. They were going to the seaside. They went to Spain. Ronnie wouldn't let him go on his own because he was frightened she might take him away. He was jealous. He was so, so jealous of her. When she committed suicide, I mean, we saw a completely different Reg. We, he was untidy, unshaven, which was totally, you know, the opposite to what they really were. The death of his wife, Frances, undoubtedly had a devastating effect upon Reggie. Everybody who knew him says that he became a disheveled drunk. The Cray Empire had begun to crumble. Four months after Francis's death, Reggie stabbed a man to death in a drunken rage. Ronnie was always screaming at Reggie, it's your turn, you coward. You, why don't you do your, I don't mind. You know. uh, on the night after it, the funeral, he was in the Regency having a, having a drink, he'd getting rotten drunk. And uh, Jack the Hat came round to, to shoot any one of the Cray brothers. He came in the Regency one night, I suppose, about a shotgun. Is any of the firm in here blow the fuckers away? Well, Reggie was just sitting inside there, up at like, the bar, on, on rotten drunk at the time. So he, he had a, a very narrow escape then. And uh, he, so to me, um, that the week later, they found out what happened. And that's, that's the reason they, they murdered uh, uh, Jack the Hat. Well, they give him money to go and shoot this guy, Leslie Payne, the fellow called Payne, who worked for them. He took the money and uh, drank it all and bought pills with it or whatever he did with it, but he never did what he was supposed to do. The twins were clearly upset with McVitie. So on October the 29th, 1967, they invited him to this house where there was a, it was just a, a local par house party going on. And uh, prior to his arrival, uh, the twins turned up, told the, the host to get rid of all the guests. They waited down in the room in the basement and a couple of other members of their firm were on the stairs. McVitie arrived, he was very drunk, been popping pills all night, so wasn't really, you know, with it. The, the Lambriano brothers took him to this party and when they got him down there, they just fucking uh, challenged him and, uh, and finished up stabbing him to death. Ronnie got him in a bear hug and he was saying to Reggie, do him, do him, I've done mine, you do yours. Bender got a knife from the kitchen, one of them fucking kitchen carving knives, you know, and he just started stabbing it in the head, the face, stabbing everywhere. McVitie's fell to the floor and Reggie continued stabbing him. And in the end, he impaled him on the floor by sticking the knife through his throat into the floorboards. It was a messy, really messy job, what they did of him anyway. It took a long time to kill him, apparently. It was a bad scene. Following the murder, Jack McVitie's body was loaded into Tony Lambriano's vehicle. It was brought here to the street in Rotherhide and left outside St Mary's Church. The following morning, they contacted Freddie Foreman and asked him to deal with it. Well, they took him across and dumped him right on my fucking doorstep around the corner from my pub and left him there in the, in the back of a car. Every single aspect of the Cray's lives are surrounded by conspiracy theories and myths. In the late 1960s, this flyover was being constructed and many believe that the bodies of Jack the Hat, Frank Mitchell, and Ginger Marks ended up being buried here beneath the foundations. Tony Lambriano did drive the body away with his brother behind him in another car, all the way to South London, parked outside um, three, four o'clock in the morning outside a little church. Fred was told to pick it up, take it away, and he always claims that went to sea, which is quite feasible, 
to me. Um, I've heard all the bow flyover um, stories and buried in different graves. There was um, a man that could melt down stuff, the smelter. I think he took care of another two bodies. But I do know the Jack the Hat story, the being out to sea, was the correct one. And they've told me that, the twins and who drove him there. They used to have a pole. We had two, a couple of breakers yards. You had one over the wall. Oh, that's right. You did and tell you had me. one at Dartford. <laughs> he used to break lorries up, smelt Ellie, and he had a big aluminium smelt. And what he used to do, he used to have an old chest freezer. He used to put them in there, then he'd cut them up no and put them in the smelt. Only a small number of Freddie Foreman's closest confidants know what really happened to the bodies of Marks, Mitchell and McVitie. Even the Crays were not privy to such sensitive information. Despite the no body, no murder assumption, they arrested the Cray brothers and their associates on the 8th of May 1968. Several gang members gave evidence against the twins after they were told that they would have to take the blame for the murders. Ron and Reg Cray were eventually sentenced to life imprisonment with a recommendation that they serve at least 30 years. Charlie Cray and Freddie Foreman were both in prison for 10 years for being accessories in Jack McVitie's murder. Anyway, no one on the solicitor's visit. Now, it's me and the three Crays sitting there. And that's when Ronnie said, he's got an idea. He said, we're going to get Ronnie up to stand up for McVitie. We're going to get uh, Scotch Jack to stand up for Cornell. We want you to stand up for Mitchell. I said, no, I've never been there. Oh, why you fucking looked at me? He wouldn't have needed at all. I would drop dead on the spot while he looked at me. He, he thought, what he thought was that we were frightened, still frightened of him, you know. We were still frightened of the craze, but it was me, Ronnie Hart and Jack Dix, Scotch Jack, we weren't frightened of him. So that was when I, my mother came to visit me with my, my youngest son, who was a baby at the time. And I slipped at his little note, Tell him, get to Nippery from Bow Street. Tell him, if he wants the business, come and see him. He came in. I sat next to Violet Cray at the trial on a, on a couple of occasions, and as the witnesses were going into the box and informing on them now that they were incarcerated, um, Nippery had got to the witnesses and they were all informing. She was turning to me and saying, why are these people telling these lies? And Scrooge took them down. And then, you know, we all went in our cells. Then the next thing, the door was open, and the, and the screw and the two, two coppers off the, the swing, he said, come on. We went and stood at the bottom of the stairs, and the judge was peeling up the sentences. Ronald Cray, society has earned the right to arrest from your activity. You'll go to prison for a minimum of 30 years. Reginald Cray. So, well, don't you two years. Fuck. <laughs> I, need, I was shot myself. Well, at first, when they were sentenced, um, he was never treated for this paranoid schizophrenia. So, of course, he went to an ordinary prison. Ronnie Cray, which should never have happened. He should have really gone straight to Broadmoor, where he could be treated. They were fine until he got to Broadmoor, and then he wanted to live exactly inside as he'd lived outside. When I saw him in, in Broadmoor, incredible. You'd think he was a Harley Street psychiatrist. Beautiful Italian silk suit, silk white shirt, double wire cufflinks in gold, the beautiful Rolex watch, shoes you could have put your makeup on in, that shiny, absolutely horn-rimmed glasses, which he changed every year. I used to have to take a tailor in there every year to measure him up for suits. Nobody could believe it. The Crays did their sorry best to live their lives in prison, whilst clinging to a name and reputation that was being diluted by each and every embarrassing charade that was being carried out by their minions. The press began to humiliate the twins, and many former firm members began to publicly ridicule them. Ronnie, whose name meant everything to him, 
was spared the worst of the criticism when he passed away in March 1995. I'd been to Broadmoor about two weeks before he died and he looked very pale and a little bit dishevelled, which was very unusual. And I, and I asked him, I said, have you changed your medication? I literally heard it on the news and I spoke to several people in the East and they said, yeah, it's true. And then I was phoned by Reggie the following day saying, I want you to do the seating in the church. He's going to be buried like he always wants to, uh, like a king. The craze had made many enemies during their reign and now Ronnie was dead, Reggie was feeling vulnerable. Fearing attack, he asked Bernard O'Mahony and Dave Courtney to protect him at his brother's funeral. There were 26 limos. There's the famous picture of the 26 limos going over the bow flyover. Quite a sad day for Reggie because he wasn't allowed to go into a funeral car with his brother, Charlie. He had to travel behind the horses with the carriage in a prison van, handcuffed. Handcuffed in the church, we did ask as soon as he arrived, could he just be unhandcuffed for the service? No, they said. As Reggie came to the end of his 30-year sentence, his brother Charlie was arrested for conspiracy to supply millions of pounds worth of cocaine. Many believed it was in fact a conspiracy, engineered by the authorities, to ensure that all three Cray brothers died in jail. Charlie, I'd been to Durham, just before he was put into Parkhurst, I'd been to Durham, and he came out in the, in the orange vest, being a Category A prisoner. And I'd never seen Charlie Cray ever white. Always had that tan, again, always immaculate. And he came out in Durham like white, looking ill. The next thing we knew, he'd been transferred to Parkhurst. And there was no reason for that whatsoever. They didn't want two Crays on the street. And I always say, the whole sentences were political sentences. But that was a dreadfully sad and probably cruel thing to do to Charlie. Charlie, to me, was his name killed Charlie. If he wasn't called Cray, he'd still be alive today. But his name killed Charlie. Charlie was just a friend with everyone. He was a charmer, a real charming man, and a, a nice man to be with. He respected everyone, he respected all the staff, being a waiter, a glass collector, bar staff, his manners were impeccable. And he got a bit of pride and a bit of dignity about him. In August 2000, Reggie Cray was diagnosed with terminal cancer. He had served 32 years in prison, so the Home Secretary granted him compassionate parole. He never did get to walk the streets of the East End again, where he and his twin once ruled. Reggie was transferred to a hotel in Norwich, he couldn't afford to pay for the room, so a friend footed the bill. On his deathbed, he confessed to another murder. Although he didn't name the victim, Leonard Nipper Reed, the detective who arrested the craze, later confirmed that it was mad Teddy Smith. Smith was a psychopathic homosexual, rumoured to have had affairs with Ronnie Cray and Tom Dryberg, the former Labour MP. He disappeared the day after an argument with the crazed in 1967. No doubt Smith ended up with Marks, Mitchell and McVitie. On the 1st of October 2000, Reggie died in his sleep. Ten days later, he was buried beside his brother Ronnie. Reggie, I say, was the saddest funeral because having married, once I'd refused my three proposals from him, um, he married a lady called Roberta. She was with him four years, I think it was. But she changed the whole sequence, and therefore it was sad, because all the old school, his old, old friends, such as Frank Fraser and Fred, they were just sort of dismissed to a, a pew in the church. A lot of people that visited Reggie were given short, sharp lessons, like, do you want to spend your life like me in here? Like, look what I could have done. 
Um, he regretted at the end of his life and told me so on several occasions, Ronnie never regretted. He never apologised. He, he never reformed. Ronnie Cray may not have had any regrets, but if he had known the truth about those he considered to be his most trusted friends, he may well have had many. That's because those he championed, as loyal and trustworthy until the day he died, were in fact conspiring to murder him and his twin shortly before they were arrested. He was getting out of control, Ronnie. He was going so far that he couldn't care less. He thought he was untouchable. I was asked to go over again to see, see them, and I walked into this bungalow, and, and there was a fellow called Charlie Clark. He was an old cat burglar from years ago, and, it, and w when I walked in there, there was a terrible atmosphere, and all, all the rest of the firm are sitting there, look, fucking worried out their life. And there's Ronnie Cray p pacing up and down in his braces with a cigarette, which is the light. He, one after the other, like, and puffing away, march up like a caged tiger or light in a cage, you know. I said, What's the, what you got me here for? What's the problem? You know. So this, he said, it's that Billy Gentry, he said, I'm gonna, you know, I'll get him, I've sent the, the firm out to pick him up and bring him back. He's gonna do him. Uh, I said, what for? What, what, what's Billy Gentry done, you know? He, oh, he's upset me, he did this, he did this. Anyway, all the rest of them, all the community, they, they sent out like four fellas to go and pick him up and bring him back so that Ronnie could fucking shoot him, you know, or kill him wherever, wherever he was going to do it. And I said, no, I'm so sorry. I said, I, I can't have it. I said, I'm talking him out of it. I said, I ain't got any facilities to, to handle this situation anyway. I said, I can't, it can't be done. Now forget about it, Ron, and, and you know, calm down. And of course, he, I got, just got him round to that, where he, was, he, was, he accepted the fact that he wasn't going to, you know, go through with it. And the fucking doorbell rings, doesn't it? Uh, they're back, aren't they? They've come back. Uh, I said, I said oh, let me go. I went down the p passage to get to the door first, opened the door, and if, if Bill Gentry's there, I'm going to push him and say, now nah, fucking leg it, you run, you know, just go. But they, they, they was there, there was, it was Donoghue and, and another couple of people, and they come back and they winked at me, like, they gave me a wink, they went, I was, we couldn't find him, we looked everywhere, we couldn't go into the run, and then Ronnie cried, did you go down the windows, did you go down there, did, where, where, did you look there and look for, for him? And, they, and I thought, so what's he fucking raving mad here, you know? And that, that was a sort of a very worrying situation then. When Ronnie Cray sat in the car, he always wanted to sit in the passenger seat. So we just, just sort of laughing about, we said, it'd be so easy, just sit behind him. Right, when you find a nice corner, pop him in the back of the head and chuck him out and let him roll down the bank or something. It, it would have been so easy. He wasn't a colonel, he wasn't a boss, he wasn't a leader of men. He was, he was a mass murderer, enjoyed like a serial killer. He enjoyed what he did, he got a kick out of it. The, really, the, the thing would have been much better if, if the fucking ironed out the two twins earlier and it saved a lot of trouble and a lot of people wouldn't have got, gone to prison and, and, and it saved the 250 years being dished out at a later date, you know? people have been alive today. I mean, with, with people like the, that topped it, the, the Billy Gentry thing, you know, when they, they that particular incident, well, when I reported back to my, my pals what, what had happened that night, you know, I just, there's only one thing for it. That's in the Simpsons in the Strand, that, that took place, discussion. I'm glad they're six foot under, the best place they can be. Yeah. They were two horrible bastards. You don't hurt your own, you don't, but they hurt anybody then. They were really frightening if you really knew them. The people who say they're lovely boys didn't know them. They were bloody animals. I thought they should be ironed out, to be honest. You thought they crashed yeah, and Yeah, the two of them, yeah. Why, why did you think? Because they was, too, they was dangerous to everybody. And, that, and uh, if, 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 if they hadn't been arrested when they were, that's what would have happened. Long after their deaths, the Crays are still revered by old-time crooks and misguided youngsters 
from a generation that wasn't even born when they took over the East End of London. More than 32 books and a succession of films have chronicled their reign, and in some cases, glorified it. But is there really any glamour in the sexual abuse of young men? The exploitation of innocent members of the public? And the murder of fathers and husbands? Simply because there is a facility to dispose of the bodies, and in doing so, play God. The